Good morning, Steel 3290. This is Jessica Vandal reporting remotely and on our course's latest developments. On today's segment, we're going to delve into the Humean Theory of Motivation, or HTM. This is a perspective that many of us share whereby desires not only explain the why of our actions, but are necessary for us to act in the first place. Now, some of you at home might say, I disagree. It's not about what you want, it's about what you believe and how you rationalize your behaviors. And to this audience, I say, keep in mind, we're talking about motivation itself. We can reason how to achieve our desires in this world, but those desires themselves are the source of our thought process to reason in the first place. In essence, reasoning can change the desires we have to achieve another desire, but it can't change our ultimate desires, the things we want for their own sake, like happiness. Being happy won't get me more money, but I'll be happy regardless of whether I have money or not. Other updates on understanding this issue pertain to the differences between belief and desire and the differences between motivating and normative reasons. Now, you might be wondering, why are we talking so much about a feeling? Well, first, desire is more than just a feeling. Decades ago, we were informed by Miss Elizabeth Ashcombe that beliefs and desires have two different aims. Beliefs represent the world around us. They are either true or false versus desires, which do not describe the world around us. Rather, they represent what we want from the world and so what we must aim to change in the world in order to achieve our desires. Now, this is not just a feeling. We often want things even when we don't realize it. On to our second update. A normative reason can justify doing or not doing something while a motivating reason answers, why did I do it? Now, the significance of this is that in the HTM debate, we are trying to understand moral requirements. Do they apply to all of us? Are we consistently morally obligated to do certain things or do we need a normative reason? Is it about what we as individuals want? First, we need to understand that you only have a normative reason if you can act on it. This is what then leads to our answer, which seems to be that moral requirements are contingent. Meaning that if justifying what you're doing means you're capable of doing it, and what you're capable of doing is acting on your desires, then moral reasons depend on you. But you might be questioning that first premise I just mentioned, about only having normative reasons if you can act on it. We will be having another expert weigh in on this with a report on another human position, Reasons Existence Internalism or Reasons Internalism. What does that mean? In brief, it's the perspective that without a motive to act on, you don't have any reason to do something. Now, before you use this as an excuse to put off some chore, let's delve into the background a bit before our experts weigh in. Reasons Internalism stresses that normative reasons must be connected to motivating states. Intuitively, we use our reasoning to justify our actions, which can be explained by our desires. What's so revealing about everything we've discussed so far? Well, the goal isn't to put the blame on or take the blame off for the decisions you make. Rather, understanding desires is critical to understanding why we do what we do. So far, the case seems to be that you only have to do the right thing if you want to. Now, wait a minute, I'm sure all of our viewers can think of times where this did not work out for them. To better understand these developments, we have a panel of experts and my fellow colleagues reporting on the issues at hand. Lauren, our investigative journalist, will be reporting remotely on her research with RI and what this means for our moral obligations. Next, our local HTM analyst will be informing us about the details you need to know. After this, field experts Joanna and Liam will delve into Schroeder's work. And lastly, our local reporter Evan will explain the significance of what all of this means. Good evening and thank you. Signing off, on to you, Lauren. Thank you, Jessica, for the detailed update on today's topic. My name is Lauren McVeigh, and I will be reporting remotely about our latest updates on reasons internalism and reasons externalism. Since our segment today delves into the intricacies of desires, I'll be summarizing my findings on all you need to know about reasons and how they relate to the concepts of motivation and desire. In order to properly grasp the Humean theory of motivation, it is important to understand what exactly reasons internalism is and how it connects to motivation. To touch on what Jessica mentioned in our last segment, 
Reason's internalism is the view that unless you have motivation to do something, you do not have normative reason to do it. So from this, we can draw the conclusion that, according to Reason's internalism, our desires are necessary for the explanations of normative reasons. Here, it is important to note that another piece of terminology that is frequently used in this week's news topics is the term reason. In this case, we should think of reason as whatever consideration counts in favor of doing something. It is also important to note that reasons must be capable of motivating us, which is an especially important idea to remember when discussing desire from a reason's internalism perspective. As Jessica discussed in our last segment, reasons can be motivating or normative. However, our current segment on reasons internalism and reasons externalism will focus on normative reasons. My research into this week's topics included a comparison of reasons internalism and externalism, so I will give a brief introduction to both of these concepts now. While I discuss these two views, it is important to keep in mind that the Humean theory of motivation assumes the internalist conception of reason. According to my main source, Valerie Tiberius, who is an expert on all things moral psychology, reason's internalism is essentially the view that the normative reasons must have a relationship to motivation. Reason's externalists, of course, take the opposing standpoint, which is that the normative reasons are not necessarily connected to motivation. To understand each view more clearly, let's take a look at the benefits and drawbacks of each with relation to how they are able to explain reasons and desire. One of the benefits to reason's internalism point of view is that it explains the connection between our reason and actions in such a way that is fairly easy to relate to. If a reason doesn't motivate you to act when you think about it in the right way, then you don't actually have reason to act. A drawback, however, is that there are many instances in which a necessary relationship between motivating reasons and normative reasons, which is central to the reasons internalist view, is called into question. This implies that we sometimes act according to normative reasons, even though they are inconsistent with our desires. During an interview, Professor Tiberius offered up details of an occasion when she encountered this directly. Last week, she was in court, and the judge told her that she ought to tell the truth on the witness stand. The fact that Ms. Tiberius did not want to tell the truth didn't matter. She told the truth despite her desire not to. This suggests an external view of desires and reason, which happens to be a benefit of the reason's externalist view. There are ways in which the reason's internalist view can be altered to account for these major questions. Although this begs the question, if the theory needs to be modified in such ways, why not just adopt the externalist conception of reason? One possible solution to this problem is to assume connections between the terms normative reason and externalism, and to assume connections between motivational reasons and internalism. This is likely an oversimplified explanation for our problem, but it might be worth considering. In our next segment, Aaron will be discussing the Humean theory of motivation in more detail, as well as giving an in-depth summary of the key implications of this theory. On to you, Aaron. Thank you, Lauren, for the detailed analysis on normative and motivating reasons. Now, according to the Humean theory of motivation, as Jessica touched on before, desires are necessary for us to do anything at all. This is a conceptual argument. It does not rely on empirical data in order to make the claim because for Humeans, being motivated to do something is having a desire to do it. If we assume reasons and turtleism is true, and all reasons are in fact motivating, and if a motivation always requires a desire, then any moral reason we have for our actions requires a desire. This makes morality contingent on what we want. In other words, in order to be motivated to act morally, we must have a desire to act morally in the first place. Now. Due to the Humean theory of motivation claiming that essentially morality relies on desire, there has been a fair amount of criticism toward this idea. These critics do not like how the Humean theory of motivation implies that desire determines what we do, while reason tells us how to do it. This entails that reason is a slave to the passions. Critics argue, instead, that reason can bring about new desires. This would mean that reason is not the slave of the passions, because reason can, at least sometimes, tell desire what to do. T.M. Scanlon, an anti-Humean, makes just this claim. He states that if respect is a kind of pro-attitude, and if thinking about the requirements imposed on us by the moral law can cause this attitude of respect, much in the same way that recognizing beauty in nature can bring about the feeling of awe, then the motive of duty is a pro-attitude that can be brought about by reasoning. The Humean's reply to this argument is that desire is necessary in order to have this attitude of respect for the moral law in the first place. Essentially, 
Thinking about the moral law can only produce this pro attitude if you already had some positive attitude toward doing your duty in the first place. After all, we have many thoughts that do not motivate us in any way. Thus, thoughts only move us to action when they latch onto pre-existing motivations. Now that most of the conceptual side of the argument has been touched on, let us move to the empirical side of the topic at hand so as to hopefully resolve the argument about where motivation stems from. Although I will leave most of the information about empirical data to our field experts Joanna and Liam, I will briefly touch on the implications of this data. According to neuroscience, humans learn to desire things if, upon obtaining the object of our desire, we receive a reward or pleasure. The opposite is true also. If an action does not bear fruit, then we are less likely to commit this action. Through our desires, we learn what kinds of things are rewarding things to do or not. This is called the reward-based theory of desire, and it, what it implies is that the desire is the cause of goal-directed behavior. It suggests, and this is the key part, that we cannot acquire new intrinsic desires through reasoning alone. Since reason alone is not related to action, it cannot create new desires. Although this is the case, reason is not useless, as it can create instrumental desires, that is, through thinking about the things we want, we can realize steps to achieve these things, and then we can desire these steps in order to fulfill our ultimate desire. So, according to the evidence, it seems like the Humean theory of motivation is currently more plausible than its alternatives. This will be touched on by Joanna, who will be going into detail about the empirical data in just one second. Hello everyone, I'm Joanna Carmelo, field expert, and I've Skyped in today to go over a desire as explained by Tim Schroeder of Ohio State University. He covers naturalistic philosophy and work on desire, which is focused on distinguishing which of these phenomena are part of the nature of desire and which are merely normal consequences of desiring. Three main answers have been proposed. The first holds that the central necessary fact about desires is that they can lead to action. The second makes pleasure the essence of desire. And the third holds that a necessary, central necessary fact about desires is that they open us to reward-based learning. Desiring something is a familiar phenomenon. Examples include desiring a glass of water, Olympic athletes desiring to produce a performance that earns a gold medal, or desiring knowledge. Wanting this and wanting that is just part of human condition. You can have an idea of some, what something is that you want. This is called a representation of what you want but also your thoughts, feelings, and inclinations are very different from other people. And it can be different from having the, just the representation, but not wanting it. Wanting it causes motivation and pleasant images, but also unpleasant images. Even if that's what desire is like, desires are like, nothing has been said about what desires are in themselves. Is desiring the same thing as being motivated or does desire cause motivation? First, we'll go over distinctions. There are, so it's a two-part structure. For every desire, there is the content of that desire and the attitude of desiring it. The content of desire is what you desire, but you might have various mental states with the same content. For example, believing you will obtain your desire. What distinguishes desire from belief is not that is not what you desire or believe, because what you desire is the same as what you believe. What distinguishes those mental states is the fact that you can take two different attitudes to the same content. Belief in the idea versus desiring it to come to reality, a propositional attitude. Desiring or desires are generally distinguished into three varieties. One, intrinsic, two, realizer, and three, instrumental desires. The first, is if one desires as a means to some other end, then they desire it instrumentally. The second is one desires something because one sees that and realizes some other desire one has, then one desires it as a realizer. The third, if one desires something not merely as a means or as a realization of another end, but as a part, at least a part for its own sake, then one desires it intrinsically. This next statement is important for outside of the philosophy of mind as well as inside it. Any ethical theory claims it is good for people to get what they want. They will need to be precise and claim that it is good for people to get what they want intrinsically. With these basic ideas in mind, 
turn now to considering what distinguishes the attitude of desire from other mental attitudes. What is desire all about? The second topic is desire motivation. The first prominent naturalistic theory of desire is probably that of Bertrand Russell in the analysis of mind. Drawing upon early behaviorists, Russell argued that desire that is desire that P is nothing more than to be engaged in, beha in a behavior cycle. Desiring has no inner nature, it is the behavior cycle itself. It's no secret that there is a close link between desire and motivation. Russell goes beyond this simple observation he holds that tending to bring about a result is the essence of what it is to desire something. Some objections were that motivation can seem neither necessary nor sufficient for the existence of desires. More recent naturalistic philosophy theory of desire and behavior is that is what makes desires what they are. Ruth Millikan draws upon evolutionary biology rather than behaviorism. To desire that P is to have a brain state that other brain states are supposed to respond to by causing the organisms to bring it about that P. Every biologically normal action is the product of a desire. Thus, even moral action that we do without really wanting to do them are ultimately done because we want to do them. For just, for wanting is just the state that brings about doing when everything is normal. The last thing I'll touch upon before passing it over to my colleague Liam is desire and pleasure. Philosopher and author Carolyn Morello describes the reward event and motivation, where desire focus is focused on pleasure rather than motivation. The objects of desire all lead to a common consequence in the brain, a reward event, and this common consequence, in turn, is what is responsible for the power of objects of desire to motivate behavior. She suggests two striking ideas. One, there is a good sense in which all desires are ultimately desires for pleasure. It is the only thing that is intrinsically desired. The rest are instrumentally for pleasure associated with them, not necessarily consciously associated, and these are realizers of pleasure. And this supports hedonism. The second is that the essence of desire is that desiring is being disposed to pleasure. So now that's all for my part. I'll hand it over to Liam. Thank you, Joanna. I'll pick up where you left off and talk about the connection between desire and reward. Since Morello's work was published in 1990, significant neuroscientific work has been done to both confirm and disconfirm her hypothesis. It seems the existence of a centrally important reward event, one responsible for both pleasure and normal uh, motivation, has been confirmed. However, the status of the reward event as pleasure has come under significant challenge and may be better understood as a learning signal. Neuroscientist Ken Barich, Kent Barich has done work that shows that the time course of pleasure and the time course of activity in dopamine releasing neurons do not coincide. What this means is that though they are in fact connected, they seem to behave independent of one another. The idea is that the reward event is a learning signal, is best exemplified by a, a rat learning to press a lever for food. The rat doesn't know that the lever releases food, but when he accidentally or curiously presses the lever and, and food comes out, he's pleasantly surprised. This pleasant surprise causes the rat's lever pressing neurons to strengthen, which makes it more likely that the rat will press the lever again. All this points to something of a reward-based learning theory of desire, meaning that the reward event in our brain causes us to learn to desire. Next I'll talk about what Schroeder calls the perils of naturalizing desire. We tend to look at desire quite flexibly. We can imagine a creature that desires but cannot move and has no pleasant or unpleasant feelings, and does not learn in accordance with the principles of reward learning. So having a desire must not require any of these things. This objection means that science may be the wrong place to look if we are to understand desires. This supports the position that all one needs to understand desires is a rough understanding of them in normal humans and a relaxed but not too relaxed opinion on whether other organisms should be uh, should count as having desires, based on how similar they are to us in the relevant ways. This approach opposes Millikan or Russell's motivational theory of desire just as much as it opposes Marillo's pleasure theory of desire or Schroeder's reward learning theory. The foundation of this approach is that there really is no basic structure for desire, it is just anything uh, causing a reasonable combination of its ordinary features. And now I'll pass it on to my associate Evan. Thank you everyone. Now I'll be summing up our final thoughts on this week's chapter on desires and reasons. Now we know from Jessica's report that the human theory of motivation is a theory where our desires both explain our actions but are also necessary for us to initially act. Some of us may propose a counter argument that people also act on their beliefs. However, beliefs and desires are somewhat separate from each other. 
For example, beliefs aim to be universal or to fit the world, whereas desires aim to get the world to change to fit them. Uh, in addition to this, our desires are actually the source of our motivation. We also know from Lauren's report that reason's internalism, in short, is a view where normative reasons must be correlated with motivation, and this view explains the connection between our reasons and our actions. Now, the combination of both reasons, internalisms, and humane theory of motivation explain that a person's moral reasons are contingent on their desires. It is also seen that moral reasons are categorical, meaning that they apply to you no matter what you want. But with these two, with these two views together, it causes a problem. So if moral reasons are contingent on desires, then you have no reason to tell the truth if you don't want to, thus creating a conflict between a person who does not want to do the right thing. Now, looking at humane theory of motivation and reasons internalism separately, we could either reject a view or accept a view. So first, we're going to be taking a look at the humane theory of motivation as a potential implausible view. So one could argue that motivating reasons are not entirely dependent on desires. Another argument could be that desires do not need to be part of the equation at all, hence why some people act on their beliefs. Now, taking a look at the second view, reasons internalism, we could say that normative reasons are always potentially motivating and that everyone has a reason to act morally. This is an option that uh, Smith met mentions. He defines normative reasons as what our fully rational selves would want our actual selves to do, being the main motivator of what we'd want to do. And with this, our moral reasoning is not so heavily, heavily dependent on our desires. And finally, we could just accept humanism and accept the fact that moral reasons are dependent on desires and that moral reasons are universal. The very plausible argument that humanism uh, offers is that since our moral reasons stem from our desires that we have, then it would be true that everyone has a reason to not lie or commit any type of crimes and so on. So this argument tends to be the most valid as these moral reasons apply to just about everyone and everyone has these relevant desires. Thank you for listening to our news segment on desires and reasons.